The following is an encore presentation of Don't Just Survive, Thrive with Omar Cruz. Originally broadcast live at naturesfair.tv and presented by Peak Performance Products. Please welcome from Himalaya Herbal Healthcare, Omar Cruz. Thank you very much, Nature's Fair, for having us out. Today's topic is Don't Just Survive, Thrive. And we'll be discussing how stress can impact the body, how it can play a role in the pathogenesis of disease, and also discuss several lifestyle, dietary, and uh, supplement uh, regimes that might be able to offset the impact of stress. The history of herbal medicine has its roots in Ayurvedic medicine. Ayurvedic medicine is the medicine of India, and it is the oldest system of medicine recorded in human history. Uh, these bamboo reeds are an example of how they recorded their medicine, which stretches all the way back to five to 10,000 years of age. The basic tenet of this system is to acknowledge and understand that the human is a part of the ecology. It's a part of the ecosystem about it. And possibly more succinct is that we are the product of the environment. Uh, one of the ways they describe this is to suggest that the entire tree can be found in some form of intelligence within the seed itself. So what they said was that the seed had all of the understandings to become a tree. And the tree itself was the mature uh, conception of the seed. Uh, the seed was hence the potential of the tree. And what they described was that the human body was in fact the seed of the entire universe, of the entire cosmology. They said that we contained within us the intelligence of all things natural and all of the world about us. And it was a matter of our intention to understand the world about us in order to understand the potential of the human body. In fact, it was this very system of medicine and in those writings of the sutras that gave us their understanding where they recorded this very line that truly stopped me in my steps when I first read it so many years ago. It suggested that the physician should never treat any patient that is filled with anger as even the correct medicine will not heal them. This was a great example of their acknowledgement that emotions and the mind could play a role in the direction of not only health and healing or illness, but even in the pharmacodynamics of a drug model. Certainly when we think about concepts of the placebo drug or the use of sham medication to uh, document the effects of a drug, we can certainly appreciate that the mind truly has the potential to direct the body in terms of wellness or in terms of illness. In the Indo-Tibetan system of medicine, which is the uh, first spreading of Ayurveda as it moved in the east uh, further and deep, more deeply into Asia, uh, they followed each of the diseases and conditions that were described in these ancient writings. And they found that all of them led to the three poisons of the mind, they said. They said that every condition, and they had a catalog of somewhere between 700 to 900 different diseases, they said each of them could be followed to one of three inceptions, one of three mental poisons, and from there they could spread into the physical manifestation of disease. The three conditions, or the three roots they described, was anger, fear, or desire. They said all diseases known to humankind will begin in the mind, in one of these three poisons of the mind. It's fascinating to think that so many thousands of years ago they had attributed all physical illness to the mind, to the concepts of anger, fear, or desire. And yet in modern times we see it's coming from a very different approach in terms of understanding pathology. What's fascinating is this quote. Um, which describes the point and position that we often see today, which is that the cure of the part should not be attempted without the treatment of the whole, that no attempt should be made to cure the body without the soul. For this is the great error of our day in the treatment of the human body that physicians first separate the soul from the body. What's fascinating about this quote is it actually comes from Plato, it actually comes from that early part of the millennia uh, where Western philosophy was being described and discussed and even created. In other words, the separation of mind and body is not new. It's actually quite old and it's been with us for several, several centuries. However, 
modern medicine and modern science is now starting to turn the corner in terms of their understanding of the mind and its role in terms of wellness. Dr. Hans Selye was the gentleman, uh, the Canadian researcher who actually gave us the word stress and gave us an understanding of the impact of stress. And what he rightly said so long ago was that there is no stress in life. There is only a stressful response, suggesting our own individual direction and the road that we travel through life will determine the impact of stress, whether or not it turns into physical illness or whether or not it will increase the potential for us to thrive in a chaotic situation. A researcher more modern than Dr. Selye has best illustrated this uh, in her research on telomeres. What you see on the screen here is a grouping A and grouping B of stained chromosomes. These chromosomes, uh, you see the very characteristic X formation or stained blue, but the telomeres are actually the yellow portions on the ends. These telomeres will determine how many times you can replicate your cells. In other words, we can actually measure these telomeres and determine how long the lifespan might be for this person to live a natural life. That's how important those little tiny yellow balls are at the end of our DNA. What Dr. Uh, Eppel did was she collected a group of women, all between the same ages and all with the same number of children. They were all standardized to be from very similar socioeconomic backgrounds and lifestyle habits. In other words, these group of women were very similar in many aspects, perhaps more similar than dissimilar. But what separated them from group A to group B was how they handled stress. Group A found that stress was overwhelming to them, found that they had a poor ability to handle the day-to-day -day stressors in their life, whereas Group B felt the opposite. They felt that they were best able to handle stress and that it wasn't playing a large part in their life. As you can see through the variance within the um, visual patterning of the telomeres, there is a massive quality difference. Dr. Elisa Eppel was actually able to measure these uh, telomeres and what she described in the proceedings of National Academy of Sciences back in November 2004 was that the women who described their lives as more stressful or less able to handle stress their cells were actually 9 to 17 years older than the, uh, than the similar group of their cohorts in other words the stressed mothers actually were aging at a far faster rate than their uh, fellow compatriots of the same socioeconomic and lifestyle backgrounds. So why is the stress response so problematic on the cells? Why does it have such a detrimental effect on the body? Isn't the stress response evolved over millennia of time so that we can best handle adverse uh, environments and certainly uh, to survive? Yes and no. And the best way to understand this conundrum is to better understand the stress response system and what it was built to do. So to illustrate those first three points, I'll show you these three pictures. First, of a tiger. I didn't want to demonize the tiger, so I put a cute looking picture of a tiger there. He didn't do anything wrong to anybody. The second, an empty plate, and this is going to represent starvation. And the third is environmental stressors, that of pathogens or even uh, environmental changes in terms of weather. So, in other words, looking at this slide, these are the three things that our body is built to deal with in terms of stress. Physical attack from cute tiger, starvation in terms of not having enough food, and third, infection or environmental weather changes. When you look at the stress response system in terms of dealing with these three historical stressors, the impact of stress starts to make a little more sense, but we're not quite there. Let's take this uh, these three analogies and move them forward into the anatomical response to stress. So let's take this understanding to the anatomical model. Let's say we were confronted with that cute tiger. Or let's say we were confronted with a historical stressor of starvation. Uh, certainly both of these things would give us a great understanding of the stress response and the positive value it plays. First of all, the adrenal glands will come into place to produce the hallmark of stress hormones, which is cortisol, as well as adrenaline, now called epinephrine and norepinephrine. These three will signal the responses for the entire body in terms of creating the alert response so that we can better defend ourselves, say, from the cute tiger and or the problem of starvation. We'll start with starvation first, however. Cortisol's role in, in starvation is that it actually stimulates appetite.
So the more cortisol you produce, the more appetite you will have. And that makes sense if you think about it in terms of history. More than likely, 2,000 years ago, we weren't worried about the mortgage crisis. We weren't worried about nuclear armament or health care costs. More than likely, we were worried about physical attack from neighboring tribes or warring tribes or what was for dinner. So cortisol has a long history in terms of human biology to stimulating natural responses that will keep us alive in times of stress. So if cute tiger were to show up or we were handled, uh, we were handed a, uh, maybe a, uh, a poor fate in terms of food options, cortisol will be there to create the incentive to eat. A lot of times people will see this in terms of nervous eating behaviors. Maybe they have a deadline coming up. Maybe they have a presentation they have to give. And they'll find themselves constantly snacking as a way of dealing with this type of stressor. This gives us a great appreciation of what cortisol's role is in that regard. But what if it's a cute tiger? Why would necessarily eating be the best habit? Well, cortisol also plays a second role, and that second role can be largely described as a pro-inflammatory response. So let's take that into greater understanding. The cortisol, as well as the epinephrine and norepinephrine, will play a role with the heart rate, as well as the blood pressure, as well as our clotting devices. So what will happen is these responses from the adrenal gland will cause the heart rate to increase, and that's there so that we can deliver blood to all the tissues that are necessary to either fight or flight from cute tiger. The blood pressure will change as a way of helping redistribution of fluids of blood. And actually what's fascinating is that the blood will actually center around the trunk of the body. So around the, uh, the abdomen, chest area is where most of the blood will concentrate. And you'll actually lose blood flow to your hands and your feet. A lot of people who get nervous will actually understand this feeling. They, they actually get cold and clammy. Their hands and their feet will get really cold. And that's a great example of what happens to the cardiovascular system. The heart rate goes up. They feel their heart beating out of their chest. Um, the blood pressure goes up. They start feeling the changes. They feel this pulsating blood throughout their, their, their field of vision as well as their head and mind. They end up also feeling these hands and cold feet. And the reason that's happening is because blood flow is being efficiently stored in the center of the body so that we can determine if we need to run away from Q-Tiger or if we need to fight Q-Tiger, we need to make sure that the blood is in a central place so that we can go in either direction as quickly as possible. Uh, so the uh, effects on the cardiovascular system are fascinating. Now think of, think of it in terms of someone who might have uh, high blood pressure already. What if their heart rate is already high, for example? Or maybe they're dealing with diabetes and they're dealing with a lack of circulation to the nerves in their arms and their feet. Now we can start seeing the impact of how stress might reduce even their potential for vitality just simply as a way of trying to protect us from a physical attack. The clotting device also makes sense in terms of how that would relate to the actual uh, physical attack itself. And that would be in terms of stopping us from hemorrhaging. So the idea here is that if Q-Tiger were to scratch us or attack us, we can't bleed to death. We can't hemorrhage. So the blood has to get thicker. The platelets and the red blood cells, of course, have to get stickier so that if we do have an open wound, we can quickly stop this bleeding and save our lives. Now, let's take that in consideration to modern day, though. So you're sitting at your desk, and maybe your boss comes by and you and asks you about a report that you completely forgot about. Now the heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, and now the blood starts to get thicker and stickier, and we're not doing anything physical. We're just sitting at a desk getting worrisome. Now we're starting to see the challenges of modern day stressors versus the adaptation of historical stressors. Next, which is fascinating, is the central nervous system will actually go on hyperdrive, which means that all the nerves in your body will start communicating very dramatically to the brain all the sensations you're feeling. What we tend to see this in uh, people who have unresolved stressors or chronic stress is they actually feel more pain more quickly and certainly more efficiently than other people. And that makes sense too if you're thinking about the cute tiger. Because if the tiger's coming out after us, we need to know where it's coming from and where it's coming into contact with us. 
a lot of the theories in terms of understanding the pathology of fibromyalgia, which is a very uh, poorly understood and poorly characterized condition, is that they may be stuck in the central nervous system response, where they are reporting tremendous amount of information from the nervous system, but perhaps all this information is over dramatic, and that's why they see so much pain, although there's no physical injury at the site. The next two are possibly the most interesting in terms of the negative consequences of stress. The first is the stomach. We actually lose blood flow to the stomach. We lose blood flow to the entire digestive apparatus uh, because digestion is not a high priority in terms of breaking down foods when you're being chased by an animal or being chased by an, a neighboring tribe. So we actually lose the potential to digest foods uh, uh, when we're under a stress response system. And the next thing, which is also interesting, is the process of gluconeogenesis. That means blood sugar is released into the body from storage units in the liver and the muscles. So the body will actually create an artificial elevated blood sugar level in order to feed the brain because the brain is the one who's going to make the decision of fight or flight. Now, when you look at this list and you take back in consideration starvation to infection to the cute tiger, all of these stress responses make sense and how they they really played a massive role in saving our lives so many thousands of years ago but when you think about stressors like traffic like work stress like emotional or family stress now we start seeing that the potential for this to go negatively is certainly um, certainly opportune and when we think about that list of all the conditions that we see in the world we start seeing that maybe stress in fact can play a role in the inception or the worsening of any type of symptom that relates to inflammation. In fact, if we were to look at all of the diseases or conditions that were either caused by unresolved stressors or perhaps made worse by the effects of unresolved stress, you'll see a laundry list of conditions that are in the news and certainly in the health food store topics every day. In fact, this is a meta-analysis I conducted using the National Library of Medicine. And um, in, in, in getting all this information together, what you're seeing is about 40 to 50 percent of what I found. In other words, the list of conditions that are related to unresolved stressors is truly, really uh, quite encompassing. And it certainly gives us a greater appreciation and a greater prioritization in terms of how we need to address stress in our lives. And certainly looking into even more recent history, if we look at the trends of mortality rates between 1900 and 2007 and just of the United States, we'll see a major change, a major shift, if you will, in the reasons and the rationales behind our mortality. Although life uh, expectancy, when you take out um, um, mortality rates for infants has stayed largely the same in the last 100 years, uh, the impact of what we're dying from has very vastly changed. If you look at the conditions from 1900, for example, what you'll see thematically is that we were largely succumbing to infectious diseases. Thankfully, because of the invention of antibiotic and, of course, of vaccinations globally, uh, this number has, ha has dwindled dramatically. Uh, but what you see in contrast to this in 2007 is a what we're left behind with, if you will, and that would be that of inflammatory diseases. Recall, if you will, that when we were discussing anatomy that one of the roles, principal roles of cortisol is to produce inflammation. And in fact, that's what largely we're dealing with today. Cancer, heart disease, stroke, uh, respiratory infection, although relating to infection itself, as well as diabetes, these are pro-inflammatory conditions. And as such, stress has an impact on the severity. So, is there a pill that I can take for that? I get that question everywhere I travel. And certainly that question is one that I hope to have an answer for today. And the answer is M&Ms. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I wish this was true, but it's not. M&Ms aren't going to help us from stress, and there is no pill that you can take to help with the effects of stress. There's a lot of things, unfortunately, that we have to incorporate into our lifestyle, into our living habits, into our mind, as well as into our supplement regimes that will help reduce the impact of stress. But there's unfortunately never going to be one pill that will handle the response to stress. So the remainder of this conversation, we're going to go through the lifestyle changes 
the mind and body changes as well as the supplement regimes to consider uh, adding in in terms of helping us reduce the impact of stress. The first thing we're going to consider is to remove the obstacles to cure. In other words, if there is something that is bringing us stress in our life, let's get it out of the way. There's no sense in adding a pill or a potion or a powder or a drink to help deal with the effects of stress if we can actually remove the stressor from our lives. So as a homework assignment, take a piece of paper, fold it in half, and on one side, I want you to really take an inventory of all the things that bring you stress. Uh, all the things that um, bring you anxious behavior, that make you worrisome or over vigilant about an outcome. Write down this list, this inventory if you will, and on the other side of the piece of paper, I want you to write all the things you do on a day-to-day -day basis to relax. All the things you do to offset that list. And I want you to try and keep this list somewhere obvious. Maybe the refrigerator. Maybe at your desk. And I want you to seriously ponder, are there any of these things that I can take off of my list? And is there anything I can do to add to this list? And a lot of times when I talk to folks, they'll say, well, I watch a lot of television to relax. So my question then becomes, well, what kind of shows do you like? And they'll say, oh, I love thriller films. I love, like, suspenseful films, or I like horror films. And then I have to ask them, do you think any of those actually help you relax? Or maybe they're actually making your body a little bit more stressed out. Uh, and when we think about it in those terms, it makes sense that maybe some of the things that we need to look at on this inventory, mm, we might have to eliminate one from both of these, depending on what we're doing to help relax. A lot of people I talk to talk about maybe enjoying wine or alcohol. Uh, some people use cigarettes as a way of dealing with stress. And that would be another thing to consider, whether or not it's actually helping us deal with stress, if it's really truly helping us cope with stress, or is it simply just uh, helping us avoid the consequences of stress and possibly even adding more stress to our lives. So take an inventory of what you do that stresses you out and take an inventory of all the things you do to help relax and see if there's any way to make improvements on either end of those columns. That's the first thing to do. The second thing to consider is that try to incorporate meditation and prayer into every one of your days. The scientific validation on either one of these is quite interesting and it's been validated in clinical trial after clinical trial. The beauty about these is neither one of these cost a penny. Each one of these can be done in any situation, in your home, in your car, in traffic. You could do it at your desk. You could certainly do it in your free time. These are things that we can easily and quickly add to our uh, daily regime, and they can have a massive impact on blood pressure, on heart rate, and even how much cortisol we produce. Again, that big pro-inflammatory stress hormone, uh, we can reduce that by incorporating meditation and prayer into our day-to-day -day lives. The next thing to consider is yoga or mild non-exertive exercise. We know that mild non-exertive exercise like walking or swimming, for example, both of these have the uh, possibility of increasing the amount of endorphins in the brain. That's the type of horm the chemical messengers in the brain that help us feel joy and elation. Uh, but they also help to dilute the pool of inflammation that cortisol is producing from our day-to-day -day stress. So the idea is that mild non-exertive exercise, in other words, exercise that doesn't add stress to our lives, can help to reduce the availability or the pool of pro-inflammatory hormones in the body. So we can increase meditation and prayer. We can increase mild non-exertive exercises like yoga, swimming, or walking, whichever one of these fits your lifestyle best. And also the mental side. Practice love, forgiveness, and compassion daily. And this is coming from a 2,000-year-old writing from the Ayurvedic system. And what they said was, practice love, forgiveness, and compassion like your hair was on fire. And that's a fascinating concept to think about how important they relegated this concept. And in fact, the more often you can practice love, forgiveness, and compassion, the less often you'll have to think about it in order to employ it. So I keep this right in, on my desk, it's on my computer, so that every day I am reminded to practice love, forgiveness, and compassion with everyone in my life. And hopefully one day it'll happen without me even thinking about it. And another concept, which may be tough for a lot of folks, but give it a try. This is something that I call unplug one day a week. 
In other words, on Wednesdays, for example, I cannot be reached by my cell phone. I cannot be reached by my email. I am not looking at Twitter. I am not looking at Facebook. In other words, I am unplugged from all of my electronic communication devices. And for me, that extends even as far as uh, television. So any of the electronics that I normally go to, I'm going to unplug and I'm going to find something to do that helps reduce the impact of stress. This is a fascinating and really joyous way of incorporating stress or incorporating stress relieving techniques into your day to day schedule. When I first started doing this, I have to admit it was very difficult to do and there are several times when I, I actually broke this rule and I would certainly answer the phone or text someone back. But now, I actually look forward to the days where I don't have to respond to anybody. And that's actually something that really I can feel the difference to uh, the, the more often I do it. And lastly, what we're going to talk about for the remainder of the conversation is tonic plants, the plants from herbalism, the, uh, the lessons from Ayurveda that gave us the wonderful wisdom of the plants that offset stress response system, as well as the nutrients to offset the demand that stress puts upon the body. The first herb we're going to talk about was written with great reverence in the system of Ayurveda. Its name was quite illustrative uh, to their concept of what its value held. Uh, Tulsi is the modern Hindi word for the translation of the original Sanskrit term, which was Tulasi, which means the most dedicated or the most devoted one. They actually used this plant to help enter into meditation for longer periods of undisturbed time. In other words, it was a plant they used to bestow peace so that they could go into concentration for longer periods of time to better understand the workings of their own mind. This peacefulness is often sought out by a lot of consumers who have found this plant to be very, very productive for them. Uh, the success of this plant throughout thousands of years is only evident also by the amount of interest it's garnered from researchers. Researchers around the globe have found positive findings in regards to blood sugar, uh, blood pressure, and certainly even cortisol in terms of its ability to help manage the body's response as it tries to deal with the stressors of day-to-day -day living. In fact, here at Himalaya, we did our own set of research and we found very fascinating ideas regarding holy basil. Uh, we took a clinical trial, a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, with patients with anxiety disorders and we measured their stress scores uh, and what we found was within six weeks of using holy basil we were able to reduce their stress scores by 50 percent. This is a nice impressive value that we can see that validates the historical uses of a plant that's very safe, very easy to approach. It's even in fact related to the culinary basil that we are associating with like Italian food. So it's very safe and very familiar to the history and the globe around it. However, holy basil was also used to support the respiratory tree. They, they used it very often as a, as a remedy, if you will, to tonify a lot of upper or even lower respiratory needs. So we set out to validate or argue against that historical idea. What we actually did was we, a second, uh, we did a second clinical trial using holy basil and what we were able to find with people with active uh, upper respiratory infections we were able to reduce the severity of their symptomology by 75 percent within seven days. This was an interesting finding uh, that validates again the second historical use. It also ties in very well with the Ayurvedic concept of the mind-body connection. They believe that fear, anxiousness, worry, or hypervigilance will have its immediate effects both in the GI tract as well as in the respiratory tree. So they associated this plant very wisely and again modern science being able to validate those very suggestions. So how does holy basil work? In the lab we've been able to identify a lot of the chemical signatures and the fingerprints that make holy basil so unique in the herbal world. And what we've been able to identify is that it shares a lot of chemistry with oregano which for those of you who know, oregano has a very large promise in terms of immunopotentiating, all of which we can extend over to holy basil. This explains in part why it's been so effective for the respiratory tree. Uh, secondly, we know that holy basil has an effect of thinning the mucus, which is ex also explanatory as far as its relevance towards upper respiratory infections. 
Uh, and very similar to what we discussed in terms of fear, anxiousness, and worry, it also has an effect on the GI. Uh, in fact, traditional language suggested that it corrected digestive stagnancy. So that feeling of fullness that oftentimes accompanies a meal when someone who's maybe overly thoughtful or overly concerned or overly nervous, we can help balance that out with the use of holy basil. And finally, we can use it as a mild nervine, which is a way of reducing the excitability of our nervous system so that we can, again, return back to a state of homeostasis. Uh, that nervine effect has particular effect on the cardiovascular system, making it a, also a wonderful cardiotonic to add to your regime. And again, this is a very safe and very common plant. It's been used for thousands of years. And again, related to the traditional basil that we use with our tomato sauce. So it definitely has a lot of history, both in terms of culinary uses as well as medicinal ones. The second herb we're going to talk about is ashwagandha. And ashwagandha means the scent of a horse. And uh, we think that they were alluding to the concept of the vitality, the strength, the vigor of a horse, for example. But it's a lot easier to think about it in terms of the acronym ENERGY. ENERGY being the most uh, approachable concept for its use, both in terms of historical information as well as modern scientific research. We know that ashwagandha's promise in terms of energy does not involve stimulants like caffeine, which is really quite important to mention because oftentimes in a fatigue setting we tend to reach out for things that actually put more stress on the body. Ashwagandha works by actually nourishing the nervous system and nourishing the endocrine system so that it can actually provide the sustenance to respond to stress. Historically, this was actually called a rasayana or a life-extending plant. That's how they traditionally had thought of this. Today we would probably call it an adaptogen which means it's a very specific category in herbalism in which this plant has the ability to both upregulate or downregulate our nervous system depending on where we might need to find homeostasis. A very unique category and a very, very small category in herbal medicine because of its real unique qualities in terms of the physical body. We also know that it also plays an, a beneficial role in glucose management. So it can help the body store and utilize sugar more efficiently. And lastly, in the tradition of Ayurveda, they used it to enhance the youthfulness of the mind. They said that anti-aging is actually all in the mind in terms of our ability to recall, to remember, and to experience joy. So this is one of the plants they used to enhance their concept of anti-aging and youthfulness. It's a very easy plant to approach, a very, uh, a very safe plant to use, and a very interesting way of enhancing your energy levels should you be under chronic levels of stress without having to depend on a stimulant uh, caffeine or stimulant drug. To add on to the ever-growing uh, mountain of clinical research that's been shown to uh, support ashwagandha's use, we did our own clinical trial. We recruited patients suffering from anxiety or stress-related issues. They were between the age of 18 to 69, so we got a large group of population, and they participated with us in a three-month clinical trial. By the conclusion of this trial, we found that anxiety scores dropped by 50%. We saw stress scores drop by 60%, and depression scores actually dropped by 65%. And that's comparing it to the average in the placebo group of 18%. So we saw a really great vindication of its historical promise, and certainly alluding to its name in terms of giving us the strength of the horse. But how does the ashwagandha work? Primarily, we believe that there's some chemical signatures, specifically the withanolides, that are very structurally similar to ginseng. However, they are, they are not similar enough to be classified as a stimulant. So they actually have a bit of the promise that the stimulant ginseng has, but without having to tax the adrenal system or without having to cause any kind of nervous energy. We also think that ashwagandha might be able to stimulate the thyroid to upregulate the metabolic force of T4 into T3. And the thyroid, those particular hormones, are the ones that actually set the, the pace at which we can literally burn energy within the cells and the body. So we believe ashwagandha also increases energy by supporting and promoting the thyroid's health overall. We also believe that it suppresses stress-induced changes in the brain, and particularly those of the dopamine receptors in the corpus striatum. That's really important to mention in terms of a stress addiction or addictive behaviors in terms of stress. If we can reduce the propensity of the brain to 
chemically link these activities with addiction, we can again suppress our abilities to kind of return to those stimuluses. This helps in tremendous ideas with regard to those folks who are perhaps looking at uh, stressful behaviors uh, with alcohol or tobacco, say, or even maybe, uh, again, horror films like we discussed earlier. And lastly, we believe the withanolides might be a gamma aminobutyric acid mimetic agent. Uh, that's also called a GABA mimetic, which means it actually has the ability to have the perhaps the opposite effect of caffeine in the brain. So again, having that calming, sedating, supportive reaction versus a stimulating reaction. So here we have a very interesting energetic uh, herb that also promotes tranquility of the mind. Very unique to find. In terms of nutrient support, I like to focus on vitamin B as well as vitamin C. Now vitamin B is actually a family of nutrients, all of which are called the B-complex vitamins. And I like to give people B-complex vitamins twice a day because the body will actually run through them very quickly. Uh, in fact, uh, for those of you who have taken vitamin B before, you oftentimes see that your urine changes a little bit to more brighter yellow color. That's actually the vitamin B's working their way through the system. That actually also means that the vitamin B doesn't necessarily accumulate any great amounts in the body, which makes it very safe to utilize. However, if you are deficient in vitamin Bs, you might find a little bit of energy from them. So make sure you stop taking it around 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon to make sure that you don't have any troubles getting to sleep that night. The stress response system burns a lot of B vitamins, and B vitamins are very important for cellular energy and metabolism. So we want to make sure that if you're in a chronic stressful situation or condition, you want to make sure that you're restoring those uh, cellular nutrients like vitamin B. Vitamin C also plays a nice role in terms of its antioxidant protection and protection to the tissues. Vitamin C is an easy and very, very affordable approach to increasing your blood levels of antioxidants. Now, when we talk about inflammation, we talked about that in terms of how cortisol kind of stimulates a pro-inflammatory event. The body needs a lot of antioxidants to stave off that inflammatory reaction. And that's where vitamin C is going to come into play. Now you can get vitamin C as an isolate. You can also get it from amla fruit, which is a very nice uh, rich source of vitamin C that has a very interesting bioavailability profile. So if those of you who are closer to wanting your food nutrients, you can look for amla C uh, versus the isolated uh, ascorbic acid. Another consideration is L-theanine. L-theanine is a wonderful nutrient that's found in green tea and chocolate, interestingly enough. And L-theanine actually promotes the brain to go into wave patterns that are similar to those when we go into meditation and prayer. So if you're one of those folks that talked about meditation and prayer in that slide and kind of rolled your eyes and said, I can't get my mind to do that, L-theanine might be a great consideration. That way you don't have to necessarily change your lifestyle to experience the benefits of meditation and prayer. And lastly, of course, GABA. We talked a little bit about that with Ajwagandha, and you can also use GABA in terms of an immediate need for a relaxant. And in, in terms of brain nutrients, again, GABA is like the opposite of caffeine. And I use this a lot for folks who talk to me about being nervous about getting on a plane, or maybe they're nervous about doing a presentation in front of a bunch of strangers. And you can do GABA to help get the brain into a more calm, peaceful place, and it helps stay there for maybe 20, 45 minutes to an hour. And in doing so, you can put a little Band-Aid on the stress response system while you have a critical situation at plan at, in place. Now, it's not so sedative that you're going to get sleepy from it. It doesn't work uh, the way a sedative would or uh, a pill for maybe sleeping, for an example. It's just a nice little way of kind of getting the brain waves to slow down a little bit so you can focus on getting your objective done. Well, I hope uh, some of you, I hope all of you rather, got something out of this conversation. And I hope that you can really take uh, some or all of these points into your life so that we can have a better chance again of thriving in this world, in this chaotic uh, time that we're in versus simply just surviving. And again, thanks Nature's Fair for having, uh, having us uh, sponsor this event, uh, for sponsoring this event for us, and certainly for all the support you've done for Himalaya and certainly for Peak Performance Products in Canada. Thanks again. Good night.